Hey there, welcome back to the channel. Thanks for hanging out. If this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. Today I'm going to be discussing the 1972 American comedy drama military science fiction film, Slaughterhouse Five. It was directed by George Roy Hill, and I'll be honest, I've only seen a few of his movies, The World According to Garp, which was a kind of an interesting little Robin Williams film, and Slapshot, the hockey classic that starred Paul Newman. So George Roy Hill also directed Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, which I honestly don't know if I'll ever get around to watching. I probably should, but um, westerns aren't, are, they're usually at the bottom of my interests. Though I saw plenty of them growing up with my dad, who uh, at the time, and I'm pretty sure he still does watch a lot of that genre, uh, a lot of John Wayne and uh, too much John Wayne. Anyways, let's get back to this movie. Slaughterhouse-Five is based on the 1969 novel of the same name. Now, the author, Kurt Vonnegut Jr., also uh, would not, like, he raved about this movie. It was one of the rare instances where the book's writer, Kurt, uh, loved the film version just so much. Um, it's kind of rare to actually ever see that. So the movie stars Michael Sachs as Billy Pilgrim, who is your typical World, world War II soldier, except that he's unstuck in time, and he has no control over where he's going next. The movie also stars Ron Liebman as Paul Lazaro, Eugene Roach, Roach? I'm killing the pronunciation here. Oh, no, I'm going to kill a lot of these pronunciations, let's just be clear, and Valerie Perrine as Montana Wildhack. I also didn't realize that Ron Liebman was responsible for voicing the character. Because Ron Cadillac is freaking epic! For one of my favorite shows, Archer. Which at some point I really should make a point to do an Archer discussion. That shows completely worth your time if if you've never bothered to watch it. It's really good. Duh and or hello. So, anyways, Slaughterhouse Five. It's kind of confusing at first to follow because the main character Billy is unstuck in time. Why is he stuck living his life this way? Eh, no clue. But it doesn't stop the enjoyment. So, what does this even mean to be unstuck in time? Well, that basically means that Billy spins. The whole movie constantly bouncing around to different points of time in his life because he lives his existence in a non-linear fashion. But in order to properly go over the film, the easiest way is to tell you it in a linear fashion. And I know that's kind of going to probably ruin things, but it makes it so much easier. So just realize that if you do watch this movie, it's constantly bouncing around to different points in Billy's life because that's how he's living them out, which is actually a lot of fun to try and follow. Obviously, spoilers are ahead here, which, you know, I do believe I warned you about these way back in my Fight Club discussion. So let's begin, shall we? The film opening is super straightforward to the point that it tells you what to expect. If you go into this movie blind, without a clue about what's going to happen, then you're about to be thrown off, and it's pretty neat how they do it. It's basically what happened to me. It all starts in the fictional town of Ilium, New York, where we find a middle-aged Billy Pilgrim writing a letter to the editor, claiming to have become unstuck in time. Then suddenly the film shifts, and we find Billy as a young man behind enemy lines in Belgium during World War II, where he and a number of other American troops are captured by the Germans. There's a fellow prisoner of war, Paul Lazaro, who develops a grudge against Billy and vows to kill him. And once they arrive at their prison camp, Lazaro attacks Billy, but is intercepted by an older prisoner of war named Edgar Derby, who over time develops a friendship with Billy. From here, the Americans are set to be transferred to Dresden for the duration of the war and are asked to elect a leader. So Lazaro nominates himself, and then Billy nominates Edgar for the role, and once Edgar is acclaimed, uh, Lazaro steps down. So as a group, they travel to Dresden, and the POWs are placed in a slaughterhouse, uh, which is the aptly named Slaughterhouse Five. Uh, one night during dinner, sirens start going off, and the POWs are headed to their shelter, and the firebombing of Dresden commences, during which Billy believes that 100,000 are killed. So now on a historical side note here, initially after the real-life bombing of Dresden, the reports ranged from 150 to 200,000 200, being killed, 
and it was basically undisputed for decades. So the city of Dresden set up a historical commission in 2004 to produce more precise data with historical, military, forensic, and archaeological research. And in 2010, it published a revised estimate of between 22 to 25,000 perished. Now back to the film. After the bombing, the POWs emerge and the Germans force them to sort through the ruins for survivors, warning that any looting would be punished. So at, at this point, Edgar discovers a, a dancing figurine, and he had kind of talked about it, and it looks like the one that he used to own, and so he pockets it right in front of the Nazis, and they see him do it. So they just pull him out, and they execute him right on the spot. <laughs> and after the war... It kind of shifts back to America after the war. Billy marries a woman named Valencia, whose father owns an optometry school, and Billy goes into the profession, and they end up having two children named Robert and Barbara. Robert ends up having a troubled adolescence, and uh, he gets into trouble a lot, and Billy ends up having to like bribe the cops to kind of help him out. And uh, the, so then at some point, we end up seeing that Valencia ends up being gifted a brand new Cadillac, and soon afterward... Uh, Billy and his father-in-law, Lionel Merble. So uh, Valencia's dad's name is Lionel Merble. Yeah, that's a terrible name. So they board this private jet. They're going to this optometry convention. So when Billy looks out the window of the plane, he sees men in ski masks and has a premonition that the plane's going to crash en route, which it ends up doing. And Lionel is killed. And, but Billy's found alive, and he, they take him to a hospital. So Valencia ends up finding out about Billy being in the hospital, and has a, in her panic, she jumps into her new Cadillac. And on the way, she has multiple accidents, and the Cadillac's exhaust gets destroyed. And ultimately, it causes her to die of carbon monoxide poisoning. I know it, it's kind of sad, but man, like when you watch the movie, this whole scene is kind of comedic. But it's terrible, like the output, of, like of what happens. It's a sad tale within the film, and uh, watching the Cadillac just kind of get hit each time she hits something or someone, and I don't know, it's borderline comical. But the fact that Valencia dies from it all makes it kind of bittersweet. So, anyways, Billy gets released from the hospital, and he opts to live alone for a little while over the objections of his daughter Barbara, and Robert ends up kind of reformed. And he ends up enlisting in the Vietnam War. And while he is living alone, Billy ends up abducted and taken to the alien planet of Trafalmador, along with a film actress named Montana Wildhack. So the Trafalmadorians live in the fourth dimension, and they teach Billy that the universe is made up of random moments strung together. And then when one dies, they go back to another point in their life and it's up to them to focus on good moments and ignore the bad. So this is kind of like how Billy lives, right? Um, but they don't really truly explain it any, in any sense that that's just what happens, if it happens to other people, or if it's Billy, if he's the only one that this happens to. And uh, we shuffle back to Earth, and Billy is arguing with Barbara about the existence of Tralfamador. And because Billy can travel into the future as well as the past, he shares a vision of his death in which he's shot by an elderly Lazaro while he's given a speech about Tralfamador. So that's technically, that right there is technically how it kind of ends, right? In a linear sense. But ultimately when you're watching the movie, it's like watching a bunch of scenes on shuffle. Now Billy as a character seems like a man who's never in control of his life because he's constantly doing things as a reaction rather than as an action. For example, he's thrown into a pool by his dad, which is a, a kind of a hard scene to watch, and he simply yells, sink or swim, and tosses him. Uh, Billy ends up marrying Valencia because she's the boss's daughter. And while, and like interestingly, interestingly enough about them, while he comes across as kind of happy during his marriage to her, you can sort of sense the unhappiness simply because he occasionally does find himself in the future with another woman during his time on Tralfamador, who is ultimately a little more attractive. The aliens are wanting him to mate with her, so there's all these little things right there. So it's an interesting little bit about Billy that you pick up on him as you watch, as you see his character unfold. But just know that he spends a lot of time in the war, so he's really all over the place. Now, I don't really have a lot of negative things to say about this film, other than you have to remember that it it was 
from 1972, which is a very different time than that of right now, which is 2021. So take that, you know, however you want. And I, I've not watched a lot of movies about characters living non-linear lifetimes. Sure, there are plenty of movies that present the story in a non-linear way, like Pulp Fiction or Kill Bill Volume 1, Memento. Those are all good examples. And I've even watched uh, Benjamin Button, which is about a man living his life in reverse. But Slaughterhouse-Five it bounces around constantly with a character being unstuck in time on purpose. It's not just a storytelling method. It's having the character that's forced into this lifestyle like the hard way. And I was lucky enough to be introduced to this movie by my partner, Tina, who showed me this uh, after we'd been out. And um, I instantly fell in love with it. It was It's an awesome movie. So it, it gets a lot. It's got a lot going on for it. And it's worth watching multiple times in order to kind of catch everything hidden in the scenes and following the timelines. I will say that the character Lazaro, every movie has to have some sort of villain, like a conflict character, right? So Lazaro is definitely this this movie's villain. And it's also kind of interesting to think about Lazaro as being uh, a reminder to Billy that he is going to ultimately be death coming for him because Lazaro makes it perfectly well known numerous times. One of these days I'm going to kill you, you know, like one of these days you're going to turn around and I'm going to be there. That's like his whole shtick, you know. He is death and he is coming for Billy eventually. And so you're reminded of it and that's the villain, like that's the role of the villain in this story, the conflict that Billy has to remember. But ultimately, yeah, you see the way he lives and it, it doesn't really seem like it's such a big th interesting character. He's borderline annoying at times, and it almost seems like he's just, you know, he's he is kind of forced into the story to provide conflict for Billy's uh, time-tripping lifestyle and to be the villain. But ultimately, if he wasn't here, Billy's life would just kind of bounce from one scene to the next, and there would be no conflict, no end point. But like the Tralfamadorian say is that even once you die, you continue to bounce around uh, looking for the happy happy times, basically. So that's a look at Slaughterhouse-Five. If you're looking for an older, trippy sci-fi tale, it's worth finding a copy. This movie is just brilliant. It's absurdly chaotic. It's absolutely worthy of your time. They apparently released a Blu-ray copy in 2017, so you should be able to find a copy floating around somewhere. Well, thank God for them internets. All right, so that's going to do it for us today. If you want to watch more videos, be sure to go through our playlist. If you're interested in the music of TCRXP, our latest EP, All Good Things Part 1, is now streaming. It's available here on our YouTube channel. You can also find it on Spotify or wherever you get your streaming service from. Until next time.